Welcome to the program. My name is Luis Roman. This is your brother and host in Conoce Ama y Vive Tu Fe. And today's uh, program is very, very, uh, I will say, important and strong for me personally. We're going to talk about a church in Orlando, Florida. And in case you didn't know, I know people from other parts of the world are watching this show and probably don't know that a parish was uh, burned, basically, okay? And uh, we don't know the, the situation completely. It's still an investigation, but this happened uh, last Saturday, and that is my parish. That's the parish I attend every Sunday. And the person that you see next to me is Father William Doc Holiday, who I really love, and I have to say that word. I love him. He is my pastor. He's my, my priest, and I'm very happy to have him here today. So, It's mixed feelings for me because I'm excited that I have him in the show uh, or in the program. But at the same time, it's, it's, uh, I have uh, mixed feelings because of the topic that we are going to discuss uh, because of the sad news in a sense. But you, you're going to see that we're going to talk about today about providence, hope, and God's uh, will. So before we do that, I want to welcome to the program uh, Father William Doc Holiday. Father, how are you doing? I am well, sir. How are you? I'm very doing happy. great. Father. Very happy to be here. I'm glad you are. <laughs> Excellent. Well, Father, uh, before we start, I would like you to to start with a prayer and to ask you to lead the prayer, so so we can, uh, you know, ask the Lord for the words and for the things that I know the people that are going to be watching this uh, episode will need to listen. Um, so, can you lead us in prayer? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit would superintend this conversation. And as the Holy Spirit brought order to the chaos of the waters of creation, may he bring order to the times in our life when it seems so chaotic that it is out of our control, but never out of yours. In the name of the Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen, Father. Thank you very much. Well, Father, I would like to give you a couple minutes. As you know, my, my program is mostly uh, people, uh, Spanish speakers, people from other countries. 40%, almost 50% is in the United States, so they are bilingual. So they probably uh, maybe even know you and know the, the parish, but a lot of people don't know you. So I would like to give you a couple minutes so you can introduce yourself. Who is who is Father William Doc Holiday? <laughs> Well, Father William was it, it was born up in the Midwest. I'm, I'm not a Florida native, but I have been down here since 1987. So, mm. as I think is probably as close as you can get, uh, not being born here. Been down here a long time. Um, uh, as I was born in the Midwest, I uh, right after high school, I served uh, on active duty in the Marine Corps for four and a half years. Uh, after that, I became a police officer. And I served in law enforcement for almost 30 years. And then uh, being a late vocation, I was ordained to the priesthood when I was 50 years old by uh, Bishop John Noonan of uh, the Diocese of Orlando. And I was incarnated into the ordinariate of the chair of St. Peter, which a whole lot of Catholics, they, they have sort of a, a for, sort of a basic view of, of, of Catholicism. And it's a, you, you, I hear... I hear sometimes, well, they're not real Catholics. And I would say, well, you know, it, 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 what, what is a real Catholic? It, it, well, you know, diocese. Well, the Byzantines and the Maronites and the Ordinariate and the Ukrainian rites, you know, there are 20, there are over 20 Uniat rites in the church that are, uh, that are self governing and they have their own particular liturgical uh, and uh, spiritual charisms. So uh, the ordinary of the chair of St. Peter is one such entity in the church. It's very relative, in the grand scheme of things, very new. It's 11 years old in the United States. Um, it is a, uh, it, it is, it was actually established in order to have former Anglican and Episcopal uh, parishes come into the uh, Catholic Church as a group, because before that, uh, St. John Paul II actually instituted what was called the uh, uh, pastoral provision, where individual uh, Anglican and Episcopal priests could come into the Catholic Church and actually become Catholic priests. Um, but with a, it was an individual thing, whereas in uh, 
Pope Benedict XVI of blessed memory, he established the ordinariate in order that former Anglican and Episcopal priests could bring their whole congregations in. And that is what our parish, uh, that's what our parish is. Uh, a lot of people look at the ordinariate, they go, well, oh, that's for Anglicans, that's for Episcopalians. Uh, I'm a cradle Catholic. Our bishop is a cradle Catholic, so mm -hmm. it's not just for it. You know, again, the establishment was primarily for that. But uh, a lot of folks gravitate for whatever reason to the ordinary of parishes, and uh, that's where we are currently in Orlando. Ah uh, yes, oh yes. I always say, I mean, uh, and and I talk about this topic, and I don't want to put you in trouble, just in case. But um, and, and we know the crisis we live in, in inside and outside the church, and um. I I can say, you know, that I found a, a home in your parish because I was looking for reverence. I was looking for good homily. I was looking for for that I commitment in a, in a community and in, in a parish. And I and I saw that there. Um, and I and I know the problems the other parishes sometimes have. And I haven't seen that in yours. So um, I know uh, that's what some Catholics, you know, we drive even far from far to go to your parish. And we really appreciate what you do. And uh, we know the devil don't like what you do neither. You know, when, when things are done the way they're supposed to be in a parish, we get all these trials. And I just wanted, unless you have anything, something to add, I would, I would like you to give you a couple minutes. So Father, you can let, let us know, let the audience know what happened a week ago at the Incarnation Catholic Church. Yeah. I, 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 I've, I've, said it several times since the incident occurred that uh, I hate saying things from the pulpit time after time and then actually having to live them. Uh, I'm sure you've heard me say from the pulpit because I do frequently, you know, I will throw out something in a homily in whatever context and say, for instance, if this place burned down, we could have mass out on a hood of a car out of the parking lot, and Jesus is going to be there as just like he's going to be in here. And then last Sunday morning, I walked in there and was confronted with the reality that we're going to have to do something like that. But even in a situation like this, the Lord, he blesses. We didn't have to celebrate mass on the hood of a car. We did have to celebrate it in our parish hall, but we had a parish hall. The news media were asking me that morning, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to walk a uh, hundred yards down the street. And I'm going to celebrate mass just like I always do. Um, this is what it, 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 the, the, I, I even mentioned to them that the as Catholics, the liturgical flow that we have is a glorious thing about the liturgical year that there's this this it should be an uninterrupted flow. And that is our anchor in this world where things are so fleeting. Uh, I mean, if things in this world, whether they be good or bad, they are not permanent. But the liturgical flow is an anchor point. It should be an anchor point for our lives. And so when something like this happens, there's got to be stress in keeping that flow going on with the celebration of mass without uh too much uh you know without the world interfering as much as we possibly can like for instance the the, the, the church I, I mean this literally uh, the church was still smoldering and we were celebrating mass down the street i mean that that quickly you know because people in the parish i mean i, I you know I, I am and i mean this in a holy way i am so proud of having a parish like where like you said before it it, it, it it i'll just say i can just speak for my part the cohesion of the people the 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 manifestation of being a part of the body of christ not uh, i told it was another thing i said to the media i said we as cat because they ask about the parish i said we as catholics should understand ourselves to be not members of a parish as the members of a club they were actually members as a, a part of your body, as your arm is a member of your body, your leg is a member of your body. It is an integral part. I said, and when you have that going on, like you, you it was so manifest on Sunday, people bringing things from the house to, to not just celebrate mass, but to celebrate mass in a very reverent way in the middle of a parish hall, just a couple hours after everybody had discovered that their church burned down. You know, this, you know, this this is a manifestation of of, uh, of of Catholicism. 
And I mean, it's so it, it's again, we talk about it all the time, but when you see it, it, it's so encouraging. And that's what we saw on Sunday, because I mean, again, it's an overwhelming state. It was overwhelming for me. It was overwhelming for everybody to come there and you expect to have your Sunday and come to worship. And then all of a sudden, it, it, for all intent and purposes, your comfort zone, so to speak, is gone. And you know, again, one of those things is just fleeting in life. And mm -hmm. it's a demonstration of where our true safe harbor is, so to speak. Yes, yes. Father, um, one thing I'm thinking, you, you, you are speaking about this, and I'm thinking about us here on earth. Uh, you know, we are the church militant, right? That's what we're supposed to be a militia. You know, we are the, the militant church in, here on earth. And I know you have that background, too, as, as, a, as a person. But that's, uh, do, do you think that's, that's, that's what we should, I mean, that's what we should do, right? But um, what I see when I saw you Sunday, and I'm thinking, I remember asking other parishioners, how far they're doing, you know? And they know, we're going to, you know, we, as you know, we have a mass here, we're going to do this. And I'm like, that's the militia. That's right there. It's a militant attitude. And I just wanted, if you can expand a little bit on that, because sometimes people forget about that. I think, That if we get, a, a, you know, we get a, a punch that we just need to let go, you know, and, and no, I mean, we're supposed to, in a good sense, fight back. Okay. Fight back in a good sense. Right. I'm not talking about violence and nothing like that, but we are a militia and militia of Christ, you know, fighting for the queen, for, for, for Mary. That's what we should do. And I, and I saw that Sunday, to be honest. I mean, I'm just sharing a little bit of me too now. But I, that's what I saw. I'm like, this, we, this is a militia. Yeah, they burned the place. Guess what? We have a mass. You know, it's not going to stop us. So what can you say about that? It, it, you, you speak, and I, you know, you, you're speaking, and I'm hearing the words of St. Paul from Scripture. And you say, we can, it, it pains me that, that in, in many places you don't hear of the militant nature of the church. I've actually heard some people say, that we don't use that term anymore. Yes, we do. There may be others that don't use that term anymore, but this is the church militant in this world. And where do we get that word? Militant, military, militia. Uh, we fight. We're supposed to fight. Like I said, when you're speaking, I'm hearing St. Paul's words as good. I have fought the good fight. Anyway, that's that's what we do. Our enemies are, like you said, we're not talking about violence because our enemies are not of this world, just like our Lord's kingdom is not of this world. Our enemies are not of this world. But when the enemy steps up, when, when God permits him to take a swipe at us, you know, we, we should swipe back harder. Uh, and to let him know that that, 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 you know, that, that he that he's not going to overcome anything. He's not going to set us back in what we do in, in our mission for because our mission can be accomplished in the parish hall. You know, it's a beautiful thing if your mission can be accomplished with very beautiful trappings and a very nice church. But our mission did not change one bit after you know, when you walk in the realization hits you and. We just go about our business, and this and our business is fighting. This is why Saint Paul uses so many military analogies. Not just Saint Paul. Saint Paul uses military analogies because military analogies are used throughout Scripture about about what we do. These you know, spiritual warfare, you know. Our, you know, our, our, our the, the the wretched enemy that we fight in the person of Satan and his and his minions. You know, this is truly a battle, and in battle there is going to be damage. There is going to be injuries. There is going to be losses, and we it, when you are confronted with that, you have to react accordingly. You just don't sit. You just don't sit back and and pray that things are going to go away. That doesn't work. Sometimes it, 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 it sounds kind of strange. As some, but prayer isn't enough in a lot of situations. Our Lord said when, his, when the apostles can't, uh, they can't exercise the demon 
from the young one. You know, they, they ask her, why couldn't we cast him out? And our Lord says, this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. It, sometimes you have to add to the prayers. And it, 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 it's not just, it, it makes it better. It's the only thing that works. For instance, in the case of our Lord exercising the demon from the child, when his apostles couldn't? Because we have to amplify our prayers by our actions. Exactly. Father, if this is the will of God, this is God's providence, uh, or this absolutely. is the devil. It, absolutely. It's God. I, I was speaking the other day to some folks about that. I said, it, 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 because they were asking, well, the cause, I said, it makes no difference. I said, if it was coincidental, then it's God's providence. If it was intentional, that's God's providence also. Because it, 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 you know, you hear me say this a lot too. It, it, it makes me, it makes me nauseous to hear Catholics say that wasn't God's will. Then whose will was it? Oh, well, you know, God was taking a break that day. He, he, he left his throne for a couple minutes to, to relax, and things got out of hand while he was gone. Everything that happens, there. Satan can do nothing that God does not permit. I mean, we see this in the book of Job. You know, God puts parameters on Satan. You know, Satan, you know, oh, Job, you know, he's faithful because he has all kind of good stuff. Our Lord said, take his stuff away, but don't touch him. And then he took all his stuff away, and Job was still faithful, and he said, you're faithful because he has his health. And our Lord said, do anything to him that you want, but do not kill him. Our Lord, it, it, he Satan is on a short leash when it comes to God. And sometimes God will use his permissive will to allow things like this to happen for his own glory. Because the, if it's approached correctly and things like this happen after everything is over and done, we have to realize that it's going to be better than it was before. We're going to be better Catholics than we were than we were before, because we have we haven't just talked about something. We just haven't thought about something. We've lived through something, and this is when our witness has a tremendous amount of traction. Really easy to look at people who are faithful and go, "Yeah, they're faithful because they have a nice church, air conditioning. Look, it's a pretty place, and all that." But when people remain faithful, when they when that's taken away from them. Like Job was, uh, he was rewarded. He was rewarded with much more after he endured with patience what he endured, and the, the same thing we should expect to happen here if we approach it like Job did faithfully. Yes, definitely, Father. Uh, Sunday, I remember seeing you walking with an icon of Our Lady of Perpetual Help. I think that's the name in English. Mm -hmm. Our Nuestra Señora del Perpetuo Socorro. Mm -hmm. That's how we call it in Spanish. Huh? Um, it's one of my favorite icon. Um, and when I saw you walking with that icon from the ashes, basically you took it, uh, and it was intact. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that, about the damage in the church and how, what things were saved maybe from there and what in others I know were destroyed? <laughs> There, that was not the only that that was that was very dramatic for me because that the uh, the fire really uh, was it most intense on both ends of the church, and that's where the heat became more, and that's where of course the fire was active there. So the firemen had to you know that's where all the water was, and that's where everything got knocked down, and it, there were some places lo looked from a distance. Like I'm not even going to go in there because everything's wrecked, and that was uh, and right toward the uh, where the uh, main entrance of the church was. I, I wasn't able to go back in there, and I, I went in there a few times to get some things out. And I just okay, I'm going to walk in there and see. And I, I walked over and I went in that room, and everything was trashed. <laughs> and I, I and I looked up, and I, I couldn't. I really couldn't believe it. I mean. That that image of our blessed mother was was on it. There wasn't a mark on it. There wasn't a piece of ash. There was no water on it. There were I mean, 
it, it, it looked like the day we hung it there. I mean, you saw it. I, mean, it, 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 I didn't have to wipe it off or anything. I just took it off the wall and brought it over to the parish hall. And it, it's things like that that, that are, are really um, extraordinary in that part. You know, you know uh, people sometimes use the word miracle, little fast and loose. If that was a miracle. And in the purest sense, it's not. But it is an extraordinary act of God's providence. Um, but the, the, uh, I haven't shared this with a lot of people. There's some people know it. I mean, it's not confidential or anything like that. But it's just something that is it, even far overshadows what we're talking about with the image of Our Lady. When I went into the when the door was open, I walked into the parish for the first. The, when I just got there in the morning, and I walked in there, my first thought was was the blessed sacrament and the altar the blessed sacrament. and you know my i did I, the door opened and that's where my eyes shot where the tabernacle used to be and i saw that the tabernacle was gone and the you know there was nothing left of the altar except for the one end and i for i, I felt sick about our lord and I looked down in the chiborium that held uh, the particles of our Lord. Uh, it was on the floor and it was full of ashes and water. And when I saw that, I, I, I was like, well, it, it, because it, it, I've heard people say the word desecration. I mean, there was desecration, you know, involved in this and as much as how much we should honor our Lord. But you know, uh, back in the back in the dark ages, when monasteries and convents used to be uh, assaulted by barbarians and things like, you know, what they would do with the Blessed Sacrament is pour it, pour water on it, pour because if the sacramental forms aren't there anymore, our Lord is not there. So they pour water on the Blessed Sacrament so it couldn't be desecrated and things like that. So when I saw the chivalry full of water and ashes, I was like, okay, our, you know, there's our Lord's not you know, strewn around here. I looked around the area, but as I was looking around the area, I, I saw a, a sun because there's nothing but ashes up there. And I saw a little spot of, that kind of sparkled out of the, out of the, the dust. And, and I, I walked over to see what it was and I moved the ashes and it was uh, the Luna from the monstrance uh, that we, that we keep our Lord for, for adoration, bless the sacrament. And I picked it up. And the Luna itself was was scorched and it was damaged and everything that you could say, but our Lord was still there, intact and everything. So that was actually recovered from the and I mean there were items of metal on the uh on the altar and some of the metal was destroyed. That was how hot the, the fire got. But our Lord in that in the Luna laying there in the ashes. And uh, I, I, so, you know, even our Lord sacramentally protected Himself from that that, that in, the intense heat that was there. That He just demonstrates that it just demonstrates uh, the you know our Lord giving us some again to use the word miracle. You know, it, 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 miracle that that word means something that cannot be explained in nature. And there's all kind of people, that, and, and rightfully so, that well, all this happened and this happened, but it's still a matter of extraordinary providence when you know everything's destroyed and our, it's our Lord just communicating to us, I'm still here. I'm still here. You know, no human being could have lived through that, like that, but our Lord, you know, who hides himself under the simple forms of bread, was had survived that whole thing. So those are the kind of things that, you know, that, 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 that should really move us in an understanding of how God works. You know, we can't, we, we don't live in a day and age like it was in the first century where we had these dramatic miracles all the time. God still does do miracles very dramatically, I mean, in the purest sense of the word, but they're not near as prevalent as they used to be. But he does still work with a whole, uh, with a, a whole lot of extraordinary providence and those are works of extraordinary providence when he gives us like the, the image of our blessed mother and he himself sacramentally survives that that, that you know that destroyed everything else those kind of things particularly in this year of uh, uh the eucharistic revival 
I mean, that, that it's, that's really telling to see things like that. And, I, I'm for, and unfortunately, in this day and age where we all know of accounts where our, our, our Savior is desecrated in, un, under, the, the, un, under the Blessed Sacrament, uh, and that it, 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 to see it, to see him save himself, so to speak, and it, it's, it's really you it, know it, it for me it drives me to appreciate the Blessed Sacrament even more. And we should you know, sometimes I think I couldn't I couldn't adore the Blessed Sacrament anymore, and then things like this happen, and it makes me adore the Blessed Sacrament just more, that much more. Yes, yes. Father, I'm, I'm, I have one more question and then we go to what is the plan of, of building back, of course, and all that. Um, the, the one question I want to ask you, that first mass at the hall for me was also very special because you had the incense. It was high mass. I mean, basically, you know, we, yeah, we was high mass. We had the choir. We got everything there. And I remember smelling still the smoke. You can still smell the smoke, the, the burning smell and uh, or scents. And then you have the incense also. It was it was very special for me. And then when you started your homily, um, well, I was looking at you. I'm like, okay, let's see how what Father going to say. And you preach as any other Sunday. It was completely you, you know. And uh, re I was really, really encouraged and happy how was your feeling of that first mass in the hall after this <laughs> yeah i i have to admit it, 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 it was it was a bittersweet time again the, the the loss was pretty up in my face uh particularly from my perspective up there at the altar uh, the uh, you know here you know, I'm, I'm used to celebrating mass on an altar and here i'm celebrating mass on a on a, on a table on a folding table uh it, so that was you know that was the bitter part of everything but to i was so happy that we could celebrate mass You know, the, oh, we got to cancel masses for the next six weeks until I find a place for us to go. And all the again, the Lord, you know, he, he knows what he's doing when he gives us resources to use. We use that. But you mentioned the homily. Somebody actually, it was a news media person, actually asked me, what are you going to say? And you're, I told him we're going to celebrate mass. He goes, what are you going to tell your congregation about the fire? I said, not a word. And they were like, I said, Everybody knows what it's a fire. What about what is it? I said this. I said I said I won't. I won't do this. I, I won't do this damage credit. I, well, I'm not even going to mention it because it doesn't mean I'm not going. I mentioned it today in a homily, you know, as an illustration. But I wasn't. I was. I self consciously was not going to even mention the fire. He said. What am I going to tell everybody? Everybody that was in there knew. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know, what am I going to say? Yeah, you know, everybody was sad. Everybody was hard. So there is nothing for me to say. So what do we talk about? We talk about our Lord's mercy. We don't, you know, it was, it was, you know, and I actually did. I was tempted to bring it up because, I mean, the primary focus on the homily was on what our Lord said about calling from the house stops. And then what did he just start talking about? Hell. And, you know, and I, I actually made mention in there, you know, I'm not using the fires. I said, but in this world, we have things go on that demonstrate to us what hell, you know, what it's all about. Suffering and loss, you know, it, it's the ultimate suffering loss. It's the uh, it's the loss of, of the presence of our Lord forever. Uh, this is what makes it so horrendously, you know, there's not enough, uh, there's not enough adjectives to, to put on how horrible hell is. As I said, not only that, it, it's suffering unknown to us. We cannot conceive of how bad it's going to be. And in, when things like this happen in this world, when things you love are taken from you, whether it be people or stuff, uh, you, you have to sit back and, and, and appreciate it for the fact that you, know, it, you would never want to live for eternity with that feeling of constant loss. You know, and our Lord does give us a heads up on that. 
And so he always wants us to understand his mercy. But that's how I end. I said, you cannot, you should not preach about hell if you do not emphasize God's mercy in keeping us from it by sending me his son to die for our sins. And then as I have to, uh, you know, all we have to do is embrace in faith that salvation that he wrought for us. And when we do that, again, you know, we can endure anything in this world. Yes, yes. And um, just for the benefit uh, of the audience, so they know the the hall was prepared so, so nice, even though it was just a few hours. I mean, the, the altar, everything was very nice, very reverent. Uh, our liturgy, you know, required us to receive our Lord kneeling and, and on the mouth. And that's how we did it, regardless of not having uh, the, the big church and the kneelers. Uh, so, so it was beautiful. It was beautiful for me. I'm never going to forget. Um, and, and God bless you, Father Holiday. Now, I wanted to give you an opportunity because this, this is important. You just said it. We need the prayers from everybody that's watching this program today. Um, but we also uh, know that it's going to be uh, the need, the financial, financial need in order to rebuild again the church, uh, the temple, and, um, and, and cause all this. And I know it's going to take uh, months, even maybe a year. I don't know. Um, only God's know. Uh, so how can people that watching us right now can make a donation and help us, uh, help you and help the community to rebuild again? They they could uh, they could send, but they could send a donation directly to the church in the mail. So many people have. Um, you can, there's a, uh, if you go to our church website, um, we, we, as, as you know, we were uh, we had plans to, for a uh, a new building, and we had be, we had been uh, the 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 fund for that building was called the multi purpose building fund, and it was kind of I, I, there was some discussion there that well should we change the name for it now that we're going to start because that's going to that's going to be the channel through which uh, donations can be made for to for the rebuilding. I said initially I said yeah we should probably change the name and then I sat back and I said no we really shouldn't because before this happened we looked at it as the multi-purpose building fund the word building being a single structure but I said we'll still call it the multi-purpose building fund but instead of the building being a noun for the a, a particular structure it'll be the multi-purpose building as a verb, the action of building up, because it's just not going to be about that building anymore. It's going to be about the church in general and the things that, you know, that, that we need to replace. Uh, so if the folks, you know, one of those two things, uh, sending the donations to the church directly through the mail or, uh, or electronically through our website. But when people get to the website, it, it's the, when they see the multi-purpose building fund, that is the, that is the restoration uh, channel. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna share that link on the description of the program, uh, and also I'm gonna put them in the comments. I know some people some sometimes have troubles finding the description or whatever, mm -hmm. so they can see the the link. I'm gonna put the direct link, so as soon you click, it's gonna go straight to the multi building uh, a page. It's not gonna go to the main page, to the home page. So right there, you can make your, your donation, and 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 God bless you. It doesn't matter how much it is. Uh, anything, anything, it will be, it will be appreciated and it's needed, even though we have insurance or whatever, there's still costs that we have, the church have to pay. And, um, and that's on us, on the community. And I'm asking you, me, Louis Room, and I'm asking you this time, I, I recorded, uh, other episodes about things like this with older priests. And I remember three, three years ago, I recorded one. Uh, with the Galatolos, the family, the Galatolos family in Ocala, when they had their own, uh, the, the, the guy that went in and, and burned mm -hmm. the, the, the front of the church, uh, we recorded uh, it's three or four years. Um, people can look it up in my, in my channel. Um, and, but this time it's different because this is, this is the parish I go to. So um, uh, that back then I didn't say, you know, please help us. Uh, I always say, please help them. Now I can say, please help us. Okay. So I'm just asking the audience, you know, as I always, they do. I know every time I have guests, uh, people help. And I know I have an audience that very active. So I politely ask you, kindly ask you, please, uh, 
don't don't hesitate go to the link make a donation if you want to send a check or money order or whatever send it to the address i'm going to put it also i'm going to uh, write off write down i'm sorry the address and um i think that's it right father did i'm missing anything no but, uh, you know, you, know you, you speak of uh, i spoke earlier and you've alluded to it and what you just said uh, this the you know, we can pray and i first and foremost i do I want I want people to pray for us, and I I, I actually in in the uh, in my homily today for the the solemnity of Saints Peter and Paul, I was I was emphasizing when Saint Peter's in in prison, the Lord actually gives us a sort of a systematic example of how we need to cooperate with His graces. You know, Peter's in prison, and it says, and the and the people of God were praying for him without ceasing. And God heard their prayers, and he sends an angel to Peter. Is it, but we all know that God would have been capable of just having St. Peter arise you know, miraculously and float through the bars of the door and then put him where he went. But he did that with, he did all with, uh, with Philip when he baptized the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, the after he baptizes him, it, 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 the Holy Spirit just took him, put him away, and put him somewhere else. So God can do that, but He didn't do that with Peter. He sent an angel to help him. But what does the angel do when he gets into the jail cell? He doesn't. He doesn't make Peter arrive. He, he he kicks Peter in the side. Get up, and Peter said, "Put on your clothes. You know, hurry up." And then and he follows the angel through the. So the angel's there to help him out. The chains fall off. The doors open. So the angel does that part, but Peter's got to dress himself. Peter's got to hurry up and follow the angel and do what he said. And then it, 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 the angel doesn't even say bye to Peter. He walks with him for a little while, and he just goes away because Peter has already received his instructions from the Lord of what he was going to do. It's supposed to do. When our Lord, the resurrected Lord, asked Peter, do you, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And if you know I love you, Lord, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, tend my lambs. And then our Lord says, follow me. So the angel doesn't have to give Peter any instructions. But Peter has to endeavor now. He has to, you know, I've helped you out. I've heard the prayers. I've helped you out. But now you have to do this. That's where we are right now. You know, we're... I covet the prayers of folks. If they can't give a donate, you know, I, 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 the prayers are as as their prayers are as important, if not more important, than monetary donations. Uh, but at the end of the day, you, you, if everybody prayed and nobody gave anything, there would you know, nothing will happen. Well, it, it, well, we're all praying. So what? Yeah, you know, that, that 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 you know we have like like Peter, you know Peter. Well, get up! Oh no, I'm sitting here praying that God will get me out of this. You got to <laughs> get up. You got to put your shoes on. You got to walk. You know, you, you, we've got to do our part. We've got to cooperate with the graces that He shows us. So you know, when, when we look at it in that perspective, this is this drives us to understand how much we have to give. And you know, these kind of things are lessons. Times are, are lessons to be learned. Like you just mentioned, you that when it was Ocala, is that like, oh yeah, we're, we're praying for them, and you know, sense of donations for them. When things like this happen to you, it gives you a whole new perspective. I told somebody today. I said, I will never view when something like this happens somewhere else the same way. You know, I've always, I've always felt bad for people. I've always sympathized with them. I've prayed with them. You know, sent donation. But it's going to be much more up in my face from now on to to understand when something's happening in, in you know in a, particularly in a parish's life where you know they may need some help and it, 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 you know when when people do help they, it, I don't think they realize how encouraging it is to see to see people I mean not just praying but actually stepping up and helping. Excellent, Father. Father, I, I'm, I'm going to ask everybody that watching the program today to your next rosary. Please do it for Father Holiday. Pray for Father Holiday. Pray for his uh, community, for his ministry, for everything that he does, that God give him strength, uh, peace, uh, health. Uh, I want him around for maybe 50 more years. So <laughs> so uh, please pray pray for that. And um, 
if uh, father if you don't have anything else that you want to add i would like you to give us the blessing and say goodbye <laughs> god the father of mercies bless us and keep us to make his face shine upon us be gracious to us lift up his countenance upon us and give us peace with now and evermore benedicta vos omnipotens deus pater et filius et spiritus sanctus amen amen thank you father god bless you really um and to the audience please just check out the links that i just we mentioned and please pray for father holiday and god bless you <laughs> bye bye sure.